When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While the beggar held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us? As if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked the murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith, in the name of Jesus, this man, whom you see and know, was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him, as you can all see. Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Christ would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord and that he may send the Christ who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from among his people. Indeed, all the prophets from Samuel on, as many as have spoken, have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. All right, so we need to stop there, but I do want to show you verse 4, and we'll talk about this more next Sunday. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. That's the last compilation number given us in the book of Acts. It's, it's beyond counting after this. So beyond this, we'll have a few occasions, and I'll show you them as we go. There's one in chapter 5, one in chapter 6, where it says, and the, uh, and the number continued to grow. But this is the last time we have a number given, and it was as a response. Remember, 3,000 in Pentecost, and now it's 5,000 total believers after this miracle, as the people then also repented and turned to Christ. Okay? So that's what we have. Now, uh, I, we, printed for, we printed for you on Wednesday because of my work schedule, so I've got a few more verses that I can give you if you want to write them down. I'll give them to you as we walk through, but nothing at the top. Okay, so you, you got what you need. The concluding verses of chapter 2 serve as a summary of how the earliest Christians lived, behaved, and served. Let's go back to chapter 2 verses 42 through 47, and remember that as the scriptures were given by God through the apostles and prophets, there were no such things as chapters and verses. It just was written, okay? So chapter 2 leads naturally into chapter 3, and Peter and John were simply doing what we already knew that all of the early believers were doing, and here's two of them. That, that's the point. Here's two, okay? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. We're an apostolic church and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. 
selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. All right, see that? That's what Peter and John are doing. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. They loved being together in Christian fellowship. And I think we can always grow in that. It doesn't mean we're having all of our meals with each other, but you can see that here. Um, you know, a lot of you are 8 o'clock worshipers. Some of you are here going to 11 o'clock. But you can see as, as people come into church, they're, they're, you care for each other. You want to know what's going on, how things are going. You're jabbering. You're talking. You're encouraging. You're finding out. So I can see Peter and John. I don't know this. Don't quote me unless you say my pastor said, although he doesn't know for sure. Then you can quote me if you say that. But maybe Peter and John were saying, wonder where we're having supper tonight. You know, I, I don't know if they were saying something like that, but they were heading to the temple for worship. That's what they were doing, because remember that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophets. Nothing has changed. That's what was so hard for the people in Jerusalem. This seems new. Peter and John said, this is not new. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, all of it. Before that, Peter quoted David. So it's all there, and they're going to continue, of course, being in the temple courts. That takes us into chapter 3. It serves as the most natural thing for us to read about just two of them out of the 3,000 plus, Peter and John doing exactly what, they, what we are told they were all doing. The event and the varying reactions are truly amazing and give testimony to a reality that is dramatically and astonishingly new. So if the people said, we've never seen this before, that would be correct. They've never seen uh, this happen in Jerusalem, that a lame man would be walking and jumping. It must have been, uh, you'd love to see this on TV or a movie. It's just the sheer joy that must have been with this man. <laughs> Holding on to Peter and John and he's just clinging just for thankfulness that he has received this miracle from Christ. Okay. Uh, let's talk about Peter and John. Because one of the things about in the book of Acts is the remarkable changes in the followers of Jesus from before his crucifixion, resurrection, Pentecost, and ascension, Pentecost, and afterward. So I want to show these to you. So let's do this. Uh, tables one, two, and three. One, two, three. You thought you were table one. No. One, two, three. Would you please look up nine, Luke 9, 51 to 55? Tables four, five, six, right up here. Would you please look up Mark 10, 35 to 45. These three tables, Mark 16, uh, 21 through 23. These two tables, Matthew 26. And table number 15 or 16, John 18. Okay? So take about three minutes. Look at what these verses have, and then I'm going to have one of you read it out loud as, lo as loud as you can. I just want to see what's happened to these two guys, Peter and John. And then we've got to talk about Peter, John, and James, right? Matthew 26, uh, Matthew 26 69 to 75. I've got it written for you there. Uh, right. So just take a few minutes. I'm sorry, have I confused you people on this? All right, Mark 10, 35 to 45. Right. <laughs> People, this is not hard. It's listed here. And that's OK. All right, let's, let's, uh, let's go quickly if we can. So somebody who has Luke 9, 51 to 55, would you please read that loudly and clearly that all may hear? Heaven, 
So there was this little town, and they were not receiving Jesus well. <clears throat> and James and John said, can we kill him? Let's, let's just get rid of Let's annihilate him. You can do that right now. Can we do it? Can we call down fire from heaven? James and John. This is a dramatic change in John. He'd wanted to kill people. Now he's talking to those who had killed Jesus and said, you can repent and be saved. You can be refreshed. We're going to talk about that phrase. That's a beautiful phrase. Uh, next uh, table is um, Matthew 16, 21 to 23, please. One of you? Is that what you have? Or did you go across? Are you in a cross? Oh, is that what the confusion was? <clears throat> I blame the vicar. All right, Mark, Mark 10, 35 to 45. I'm sorry. I now see the problem. Okay, go ahead. Does anybody have Mark 10? I thank you, Faith. So this is that episode when James and John went to Jesus. They knew it was towards the end of something wonderful. They said, we want two special places in your kingdom, which is audacious, number one. And when the others found it, they were very upset with James and John. And now you got Peter and John together as partners. So there, there was stuff going on for the disciples. We're going to skip over the others. I, I can see I confuse you. But every one of those, if you want to look it up later, is an example of Peter and John having it wrong. As they were seeking to follow Jesus, they were his disciples, and in three years, they did not learn as much as they learned once that crucifixion, uh, resurrection, ascension, Pentecost came. These are changed men of God. Okay. But Jesus, in all of this, has still identified Peter, James, and John in a separate way that were never truly given his reason. And of course, his reason is be all understanding. But if you've ever asked us, why, why Peter, James, and John? Why did he choose them as three who would have select opportunities? Why not Philip, Andrew, and Bartholomew? Why not those three? They, they, they clearly were chosen by Jesus, but there was something that Jesus knew or perfectly understood about his kingdom and these three, and how they would become pillars, as it were. Peter, James, and John. For those of you who wonder about James, let's talk about James, okay? Well, we'll get to that in a little bit, sorry. So the Mount of Transfiguration and the Garden of Gethsemane, those are two of the uh, parts of Jesus' ministry moments where he said, come along with me, you three, Peter, James, and John. The rest of you stay behind. So they were being identified, maybe taught, maybe built up as, as knowing what they needed to know to be leaders in the early Christian church, and they surely were. Okay. But now this. There's a confidence in the name of Jesus is present in these two men that somehow seems natural. They do, however, seem to have had at least some experience with such a Christ-centered authority. Before I get, well, let's, let's all turn to Luke 9, verse 1. Let's all turn to Luke 9, verse 1. Then I know we got it. Some of you may be asking, because you are those kinds of people who want to know as much as you possibly can, well, where's James? Don't know. James is first mentioned in the book of Acts, in Acts 12, when he's executed. 
by Herod. There's a lot to ponder about that one. And I'll share, you with, I'll share with you what some of my pondering is. James had not given up his role as leader. That's proven by Acts 12 when Herod said, I got to stop this movement. Bring me a leader. They brought him James. That can only be because everybody knew James was the leader. This has nothing to do with this, but I think it's a hint. If you've ever read the book, Good to Great, it's a business book. I had to read it for my doctoral studies. And it identified American companies that had been good and solid. And then with a change in leadership, they became exceptional. And one of the things that they found was true about those good companies, Walgreens was one of them, I know for sure, that then all of a sudden just grew exponentially. They had a leader who did not care to be known. People said, well, who's the leader of Walgreens? Well, let's check the records. And you could find out, he wasn't hiding. But he or she had such a heart for success, this is not about me, it's about the company. And I've, I've thought about that when I read the book, this is years ago, I, th I thought about James. Um, boy, we give him short shrift. I've, I've done this with you before. In the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, were churches named saint. The most common is St. John, which beat St. Paul by about seven. It's like 450 to 443, something like that. Peter is down the list at about 200, and James is about 40. Now, I'm not going to go on a, a rampage and say we need more St. James's, but he was a quiet leader. And we know he was involved because of Acts 12. We'll, we'll, we'll get there in a few weeks. I'm sorry, a few months. <laughs> we'll get there. It is fascinating because Herod said, got to stop this movement. I got to kill the leader. Bring me a leader, James. Done. That's all we read about James. Now, there are other Jameses. But that James, Peter, James, and John, John's brother, son of Zebedee, that's that guy. He said, all right, Peter and John, they went to the temple, where's James? Don't know. What was he doing? Don't know. Did he bow out? No, he didn't bow out. He was leading. And I think in a very, I don't want to say magnificent if you misunderstand that, but I think in a magnificent way, he was there. All right, okay, that's my sermon. Uh, 1 Peter 1, 13, oh, Luke 9, verse 1. Yeah, 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 Luke 9, verse 1. Somebody please, loudly and clearly. When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and their diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to do that, he, uh, and to heal the sick. He told them, take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra tunic. Whatever house you enter, stay there. All right, good. Thanks, Dan. So we have reason to, to understand, not, to, not just guess. We know that the disciples had at least that experience in healing the lame, the ill, the diseased. We have that exp they had that experience already. So when Peter and John are going to the temple, it, it, it seemed like they had been taught by Jesus what to do, how to respond how to bring forth a healing in the name of Christ. So Jane knows this, maybe, maybe some of you don't know this. If in all my years as senior pastor, different places, longest being here, praise God for that, at least I do, you may not. I always felt it was my responsibility to be the main preacher. I just, it, it, it wasn't arrogant. I just felt that's my responsibility. That's my call. That's what they called me to do. I owe that to the people of God. If, however, 
a man named Ted Lesh had been on my staff. He'd have preached every Sunday. And I would have sat at his feet. He was the preacher. I was never not, he was a chaplain in uh, Northern Illinois District, then became the district president. But I remember a sermon he gave to a pastor's conference on this. And he said, right there in the phrase, what you gonna do with what you got? I remember that, because he didn't talk like that. I mean, he was more erudite than that, but that's exactly how he said it. What you gonna do with what you got? Peter said, got no money, because <laughs> that's what the man wanted. And the man wasn't even looking. He was, okay, more people, here's my job. My job is to beg, money please. Peter said, look at me, I got nothing. Oh, oh, except this, get up and walk, in Jesus' name. Roger. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to think about with, with, this, with this reality and, and what's going on in this, but um, Peter talked about silver and gold in his letter, right? So let's turn there. 1 Peter 1, 13 to 21. 1 Peter 1, 13 to 21. Hebrews, James, 1, 2 Peter. Okay, let me read. I know that with the air conditioning going, it's kind of hard to hear everybody. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy, because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you are redeemed from the empty way of life, handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. We've talked about that theme last times. Through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. I don't know that when Peter wrote this letter, this was later in his life, he was an older gentleman, probably not far from his own execution. I don't know that he remembered or thought of that moment in the temple um, the courts when, when the, the, the layman uh, asked for money and Peter said, I don't have silver or gold, I don't have it. But what I got, I'm gonna give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. <laughs> Is this, to me, chapter three is just a throw back your head and laugh kind of a, kind of a chapter. The ways of God are, are simply astonishingly beautiful. All right, back to Acts three. We read that the crowd was filled with wonder and amazement and were astonished. You can see the reaction in chapter two. We're not gonna turn there. We also know that the gathered crowd included, again, at least a few of those directly involved and connected with Jesus' crucifixion. Peter said, you did this. Peter's message addressed a specific sin, but also included were all who knew the Old Testament scriptures, yet still did not recognize Jesus for who he truly was, and I capitalized those words as a title of him, he who truly was the promised one. In, in Acts chapter three, what does Peter call Jesus? The author of life and the servant of God. We're gonna unpack those words too. But first I wanna take you to, and these verses I did not write down. So everybody from here to the south, okay, would you please read John 18, 38 to 40, and everybody here to the north, John 19, 12 to, 20, 12 to 16, all right? John 18, 38 to 40, and John 19, 12 through 16. 
And remember, this is only a few months after the crucifixion and resurrection. It was indelibly placed into the minds and hearts of all of Jerusalem. They knew what Peter, uh, what Peter and John were talking about. Okay, somebody, John 18, 38 to 40, please. Thank you, Laura. So, and we know from another gospel that he was also a murderer. But here we have the text in John that they asked for Barabbas rather than Jesus. Peter quotes that in his sermon in Acts 3. He said, you asked for a murderer to be released rather than the Son of God. Okay. Now, John 19, 12 through 16, and we don't have this from Matthew, Mark, or Luke, only it's from John. Wait a minute. John was the one in Acts chapter 3. This is interesting. See how well it comes together beautifully? This is from John's telling us. All right, who has John 19, 12 through 16? Thank you, Patty. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. And Peter's calling him on it. You wouldn't even let him do what was right. Okay. So that's all part of the sermon in chapter 3, uh, verse um, 13. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You discern the holy and righteous one and ask that murder be released to you. These words are cutting to their heart. Just like the words in Acts 2, we read, the, and, and the, they were cut to the heart. That's what's happening here as well. Remember the number in chapter 4. Now it's 5,000. So the response to this particular sermon is nearly as successful number-wise, although for salvation of one, it's equally beautiful, even for one to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. You've got all that happening here. And Peter says, we all know what happened. We all know Pilate tried to set him free. You wouldn't let him. And then you asked for a murder. Shame on you, in other words. Okay. And they repented and were refreshed and forgiven. All right, back page. <coughs> Pardon me. We note the names by which Jesus is here identified. His servant Jesus. I give you some cross references there the author of life, and the holy and righteous one. Let's take a few minutes to look at that. Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 53. Well, yes, Roger. When, uh, when I could hear that. Oh, I think uh, the, the question that Roger said, was he, was he speaking specifically only to the, to the leaders or to people in general? I think it was to the whole crowd. But I think, I think when we understand what happened, you know, remember Passover was one of the festivals and Pentecost was one of the festival, festivals. So you got people who probably remained in Jerusalem or lived there. They were all complicit one way or the other. Uh, the leaders certainly were. But the crowd was part of that whole process, too. And so there may have been some in the crowd who were among those who simply shouted, crucify, 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 which, of course, is every bit as guilty as those who maneuvered. And when we, when we read the Gospels carefully, that was a political uh, maneuvering like we've seen in history throughout politicians of every generation. And if you think this is new, you're just naive. I'll say that as nice as I can. If you think our, our, anyway, Isaiah 53. <clears throat> Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance 
that we should desire him. In other words, it wasn't, it, it was Christ's message and love and forgiveness and gift of eternal life that have, have attracted us to him, not how, how, how tall he was or, or how strong he might have been or the shape of his ears or anything like that. Oh, that was a good looking guy, I'll follow him. Had nothing to do with that. In fact, that he was treated so badly that people could barely look upon him in the crucifixion those hours. It was hideous. Okay. So remember the old movies uh, of, of Jesus' life? Um, and it's, it's really become much changed over the last 30, 40 years, 50 years. But there was, Jesus was always in the whitest robe, and, and he was always the, uh, the, 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 the cleanest, and, and uh, you just, you were around, oh, I'm not, I got no dust on me. I've not sweated today, you know, and they, you know, no. Three, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shear is a silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants, which would be us? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand after the suffering of his soul. He will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant, there's the connection, will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great and he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death. It was numbered with the transgressors for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So when Peter in this speech in Acts 3, refers to Jesus as the servant, and here is yet another Old Testament connection. This is crucial for the people of Jerusalem to see and to understand. This is not new. This is not something that is absolutely fresh. It is a continuation as God has spoken perfectly. It is the fulfillment of everything we've known and for everything that we've been waiting on. He's the one. He's the servant of God. That would attract the memory of at least some in that crowd. He was the author of life. That means he's also the creator. That's not a small thing. Who did we just kill? A great man? No, you killed the author of life. Well, now that would be serious, wouldn't it? So you can see the call for repentance and how by the Holy Spirit, we got a, I'm gonna say 2,000 more, but I know there might have been more growing, and I don't think it's 5,000 exactly. I think we understand numbers, about 5,000. 5, the author of life? So you're telling me he is God in the flesh? Yes, that's what I'm telling you. I don't know that Peter knew that for much of those three years of Jesus with the ministry, but he knew it now. Okay, so cross-referencing would be Hebrews, Chapter 12, really close to where we were with 1st, 2nd Peter. Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter. Hebrews chapter 12. Verse one, therefore since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us throw off everything that hinders 
and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Now, author of life is what Peter says, but author and perfecter of faith is what the writer of the Hebrew says. We don't know the name of that man, but whoever it was, it's the same, it's the same concept. Author is one who begins, who creates. Remember last week in the sermon, if you were here upstairs, I showed the word poema. One of my pastor friends has a tattooed on his arm. That's to create. It's an author which, which gives birth to something. It talks about him as a creator, author of faith, author of life. All right. So Peter uses that. And then the holy and righteous one that's also used by Stephen in Acts chapter 7. So let's turn to Acts chapter 7, 51 to 53. This is at the conclusion of Stephen's uh, immaculately beautiful speech before the Sanhedrin when they were calling him to account. He told everything that's true, and they're like, okay, yeah, we'll listen to you. And then he gets real personal, just like Peter got in Acts chapter 3. You stiff-necked people, with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet? Your fathers did not persecute. They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. And then they killed Stephen by stoning him to death. All right, so um, in Peter's speech, there are three ways that Peter refers to Jesus. They would have connectors all the way through the scriptures, Old Testament and New Testament alike. Okay. Also of interest, comma, in my opinion, is the unique wording in the call to repentance. Can you go back to chapter 3 with Peter's speech on that one? Sins will be wiped out, which is, of course, a new phraseology. Wiped out is, is um, that, that phraseology we haven't quite seen before. You know, sins forgiven, washed away, we've seen that. But the phrase wiped out is, is a nuanced, it's, it's just, the truth is growing. It's spanning. It's wiped out. Okay. Which, of course, is new phraseology. It was perhaps remind them and us of Psalm 103, verses 11 to 12. But also, here's this. And, and this is also new in, in the gospel presentation in the book of Acts. I'm in verse 19. Repent then. Turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. The times of refreshing may come from the Lord. All right, that's epexegetical. What does epexegetical mean? We use this in English a lot. We will say a phrase, and then we'll have a second phrase, which is simply an explanation of the first phrase. Okay, epexegetical, it explains. So wiping out sins is refreshing times. When your sins are wiped away, that refreshes you. It's not something different. Like your sins are right away, oh, and then maybe you'll have, no, it's the same thing. I'm saying it in two different ways. It, it's exegetical, okay? I can't even think of an example right now, except you'd say, um, I want you to meet my neighbor and my friend. Well, is that two different people? No, it's one person. My neighbor is my friend, my neighbor and friend. So exegetical. So this is a time, we're, we're now introduced to the reality, forgiveness of sins is a time of refreshing. And for us, it's eternal. Times of refreshing are here. My heart's refreshed. Okay. Remember that eternal life is fulfilled in the heavenly kingdom, but eternal life is also now. First John 5. Oh, John. John. He, well, he's one of those two guys. Isn't it interesting how that all comes together? John said, this is eternal life. First John 5, verse 12. This is eternal life that you believe in the one he has sent. This is eternal life. Every one of us now is living eternal life. And our times are refreshed. Click off the news, boys and girls. It will not refresh you. But being forgiven by the God of creation who died for me, that's refreshing. Elton. Lynn. Oh, Lynn. Hey, Benzidi Hand Ho, Lynn. Raise that hand high. <clears throat> Just 
we're going to talk about that. Something different. Right. Right. Yeah, Jane and I just quoted, I forget who made the quote, but um, I can, um, because God has forgiven the unforgivable in me, I can forgive the unforgivable in another person. In my defense, the last main paragraph on my study sheet goes exactly what, what Professor Lynn has just said. <clears throat> well said. That's my point. There is also the use of the word ignorance, verse 17, which often is used in making excuses. But we also know that ignorance of the law is no excuse, and so forth. So this word does not excuse the people, but shows just how lacking in godly wisdom they were truly were. They were ignorant. That's not inexcusable, but it shows how utterly dark were their minds. They actually crucified the Lord. Now, that's ignorant, okay? So let's build on that because we're going to see this in, well, okay, let's, first of all, uh, I, I've added a verse here that you don't have, 2 Corinthians 4. Let's go there first, then we'll go to 1 Timothy 1. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4. And I'm going to read there um, verses 1 through 4. So every once in a while in a sermon or a Bible class, I'll say, remember who we are by nature. Scripture teaches we're spiritually blind to the truth, dead in our sins, enemies of God. And sometimes I say that too quickly. But this is, this is the, uh, what I would say, proof text. There are others. But this is the proof text that, that by nature we're blind to truth. Okay? Therefore, verse 1, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In other words, not to those who have been saved. The minds of um, veiled those who are perishing Verse 4, the God of this age, Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, unless the Holy Spirit works in their hearts. But by nature, people, mankind, you and I, by our sinful nature, we were blind to the truth. And then you start creating your own truth. You invent your own truth. Because you're blind to the truth. You can't see it. You're blind. Okay. It's no excuse. Just like ignorance is, like Lynn said, no excuse. Okay. Paul himself, the Apostle Paul, uses that in 1 Timothy chapter 1. I keep going a little bit further to the back. Thessalonians Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 1, uh, verse 12, chapter 1, verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord has poured on me abundantly, along with a faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Okay. Ignorance is no excuse. He said, because I was ignorant, I killed, I blasphemed, I hated, because I was ignorant, and I needed to be saved. So the word because uh, should not be misunderstood by us who sometimes use that word lightly. 
Oh, Paul, you're just so ignorant. Oh, it's okay. Uh -uh. The only answer to Paul's ignorance was the mercy of God. That's the only answer. There's no other answer. The other answer is, well, I'll try and be better next time. That's no answer. That's not going to save you. But repentance and then being forgiven and having your whole life refreshed, yeah, that's the answer. And so Peter and John, and it looks like Peter's doing the main talking, but I'm not selling John short on this one either. Um, they just, these are remarkable men who lived out the gospel, and they themselves have been refreshed. You know, we think about Peter. Uh, well, he denied Jesus three times. Yeah, that was bad, Peter. Well, how about John? Can we kill that village? Can, can we? Well, how is that any different, you know? And here are these men talking about having your lives refreshed by being forgiven, even of killing the author of life. And um, the message is, is there for us. All right. Now, let's go back to Acts 2, because i got a couple questions for you to ask, um, for me to ask you. Acts 3. I didn't say Acts 2. Acts 3. <laughs> Verse 20 and 21, I want to ask you, where is Jesus? Just read it silently. Verses 20 and 21, where is Jesus? How would you answer that? Where is Jesus? And let me pick it up at 19. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. I did quote Psalm 103 in that. We may not get there, but if you want to look at it later, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. That's Psalm 103. Okay. Uh, where am I? 19. The times of refreshing may come from the Lord and that he may send the Christ. Who has been appointed for you? It's, that would be Jesus, even Jesus. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything. So where's Jesus? Because Peter says, he, just repent and he'll be sent to you. But he's got to remain in heaven. And of course, Jesus is everywhere. He lives in our hearts. That's a biblical phrase. Okay. Kingdom of God is a phrase that in scripture refers to one of three things. <clears throat> personal faith. The kingdom of God is within you. Personal faith. The kingdom of God is also used to refer to all believers, or we would say the church on earth. And it refers to the heavenly kingdom, the eternal kingdom, the kingdom of God. So the beauty of knowing Christ is seated at the right hand of God the Father, but he says, I'll be with you wherever you go, even to the ends of the earth. He is yet with us, and yet he is at the Father's right hand, ruling over the world for our sake. It's one of those high teachings that's difficult to grasp since we are grounded and limited. Thoughts on this? Okay. Um, I told you about chapter 4, verse 4. That's the, the one more measurement of growth in the last time that we have that. Um, there's a book that's hard to read. It's called Flatland. We might have it in our library, Lynn. It was one of our Christian readers group assignments about 15, 20 years ago. And uh, David Cooch, if you remember David, retired pathologist, since died and gone to heaven, but David wanted us to read it. And Flatland is an allegorical tale on a world where there's only two dimensions. There's no third dimension. There's no height. There's no weight. It's all flat, Flatland. And someone comes from a different world and says, you know, there's more than this. But you can actually see height and largeness. And the people thought and couldn't understand that. They said, we can't even imagine. What are you talking about? 
That's beyond our imagination. We have no idea what that would be like to, to be anything but flat. That, no, that can't, that can't be possible. And I think sometimes we find ourselves saying, I don't even understand this. But when, I mean, it's right there in, in Peter's sermon. Uh, Repent so that Jesus will come to you, but he must remain in heaven until the last day, or however he says it. Okay. All right. So he's with me. Jesus is with you. But he's at the right hand. He's not coming back until the end time. That's right. And he's with all believers. That's right. Around the world. That's right. Wherever they are. That's right. Got it. Okay. The glory of his love and how he condescends, and I'm using that word rightly, condescends to dwell within us. And yet he's the God of creation who will be glorified in the end by every single person. Got it. And he loves me. Yep. Yeah, that's refreshing. That's really refreshing. And that, that word that Peter uses there, I think, is an indicator of how his own life has been refreshed through forgiveness. All right, I'm done. Jane. We're not done. I'm done. Go ahead, Jane. Hear that? Nobody heard it, Jane. Go back to <laughs> go back to Second Corinthians four. She said, Paul goes on and says, but he's the one we proclaim. We will proclaim him. Uh, we do not preach ourselves, verse five, but Jesus Christ is Lord and ourselves as your servants. For Jesus' sake, for God has said, let light shine out of darkness. And Jane's point was that yes, in, the, in a world where there is blind unbelief all over, we are still called to proclaim. So, and then she said, do you know who the who a speaker was who said that? She heard a speaker recently who said, faith is, is personal, but it's not private. It's personal, but it's not private. I'm not hiding it from you, but it's personal. He lives within me, but I'm sharing them. That's your point? Yeah, thanks. Charlene. Kind of along with that, <clears throat> I really pray for, for the blind, for those who are spiritually, spiritually blind. Spiritually blind. And, and uh, Stephen did it. Father, don't hold this sin against them. Yep. And Paul was probably there. Paul was there. Paul was there. Yeah. Saul was there uh, giving approval of Stephen's death, and Stephen prayed for him. Not by name, but all those who were involved in killing him, don't hold the sin against them. I, I, I would say our prayers for the unbelievers of this world are simply that God would be at work, turning hearts to him. Bring forth, the truth. Bring forth truth. Turn hearts to you, Lord. Show them the glory of what we know, that they would have the same refreshing, refreshing life that we have. We, we don't want them to go to hell. In our sinful nature, sometimes I think we do. Sometimes I think we do. You don't think they deserve it, yeah, they're not good enough. Yeah, they, they've done bad things. Yeah, okay. Get in line on that one, right? Yeah, get behind me. All right, Dan Roger. kind of does. Yeah, uh, 
th there is no salvation outside of God working through the means of grace. What are the means of grace? This is on your test, eighth grade, remember? Holy Word of God, Holy Baptism, Lord's Supper, Holy Communion. Those are the ways in which God works and keeps us in faith. So we want those gifts to be available, starting with the Word. You know, communion is reserved for those who have been moved by the Word and baptism into faith and then growing in knowledge. Um, yes, thank you, Roger. Very, very good. Yeah. Roseanne. I, w I would put it this way, it's the truth. Even though there are times in our lives when we are simply forgetful that he's there, or emotionally it hasn't given us refreshing, we're putting him aside, but he still dwells within us. So the promises of baptism, Romans 6 is one of the good ones, Colossians 3 is another one, Romans 8 verse 1 is another one. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What does that mean, in Christ Jesus? That means you are baptized. There's no condemnation. So I could go a day or a week or a month, and I'm just dull or even worldly or even behaving in ways that are not seeming. They're not godly. That does not change his hold upon me. If salvation depends on how I am from day to day, we better all be worried, sick. We better just be, we, we ought to be living in worry. But I'm telling you, don't worry. You're his. Can you do better this week? Yeah, I think you can. Give that to God too in prayer. You know, say, okay, I'm going to be better. Well, no, give that to God in prayer. Spend more time in his word, all of those things. But my, my faithless week or month or months does not undo his gift of salvation. Yeah, I'll stand on that one. By the way, I thought about this in, in the hymns that we sang this morning. When I tread, what is it, when I come to the, of, of Jordan? Whenever you see a river Jordan or something like that in a hymn, except for John the Baptizer in Advent, that's different. But when I cross the Jordan River, that's a, that's a, a reference to death. So was it one of the second, was it the second communion hymn that we sang? I don't know. But I just thought, you know, I, I don't know if we always get that, but that's when I tread the verge of Jordan. When I, when I da, 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 da. Say it again. Yeah, the problem, yes, you got to go through it. Don't, don't be scared. Go through. Yeah. Well, I just ended this class badly. <laughs> it's in the hymn, though. I sang it myself this morning. All right, next week, I'm here with you, Acts chapter 4. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, go with us now uh, in a way that by your Holy Spirit builds us up always in the refreshment of having our sins forgiven and being yours forever. We pray it in your amazing and wonderful name. Amen. See you.